welcome you guys out to the first session of our Gospel Cohort meeting, and uh, I'm excited to be able to uh, spend this time together uh, talking about how we can be more effective with our Gospel conversation. And uh, so, uh-oh, what happened? <laughs> Any, uh, okay, there we go. Okay. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get started with a quick word of prayer. And then I'm going to let folks introduce themselves. And then I'll introduce our guest presenter today, Dr. Bob Boyd, who's a good friend of mine. He's there waiting and his wife is there as well. So uh, but let's go uh, to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the technology that is enabling us to meet today, Lord in all these different locations and to talk about gospel conversations. Lord, we know, first of all, that gospel conversations are your idea. Uh, you have commissioned us to go into all the world and proclaim the good news. And so I pray, God, that you will help us as we talk about that today, as we get our, our uh, session going. Lord, I'm thankful for each and every person that has signed up uh, to be a part of this group. And I pray, God, that you will just... Uh, Help them to receive a blessing out of it. But most of all, I pray, God, that you will help them to uh, become better witnesses for you, Lord, so that we can be more effective for your kingdom. Most importantly, though, Lord, that we might become disciples who make disciples. And, Lord, we just ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So uh, let's see. Let me look at my participant list here. Uh, Cheryl, just uh, take a moment to introduce yourself and maybe share with you uh, what one thing is you hope to learn through this uh, Gospel Conversations cohort. Um, my name is Cheryl Cope. I've been going to um, Central for about, probably about 12 years now. And um, the Lord has really um, made it clear to me my purpose on this earth about sharing the gospel. That's why I belong to Faith Riders. And I am really drawn to witnessing ever since Faith Riders. There's uh, a fire just burning to share the gospel. Um, and I hope that, you know, from these series that I can be more effective um, at, you know, helping people along in each and every, they're all from so many different situations. And, um, just being able to reach them where they're at is, is how, how I want to be able to go about it. And I'm hoping that, you know, this series can help me or guide me uh, along the lines. Great. I appreciate that. By the way, I just want to let everybody know that Penny is recording this session so that we can uh, have it available for anybody who may have to miss a session for whatever reason. So I hope that's okay with everybody. Uh, so just letting you know that. All right, Chris Edmonds, Edmondson, uh, would you introduce yourself and share one reason, one thing you hope to gain out of this uh, group of meetings? Yeah, um, I'm, my name's uh, Chris Edmondson. Uh, well, um, not too long, probably I'd say nine months now, maybe. And uh, I just hope to learned how to be more confident and um, and cohesive sharing the gospel. All right. Welcome aboard, Chris. I appreciate that. Gerald, my uh, witnessing buddy who's been with me several times down to New Orleans, and uh, he's also a faithful member of uh, uh, Church there in Zebulon. So, Gerald, uh, share just a brief bit about yourself and uh, what you hope to gain by being a part of these meetings. Well, my name, like you said, is Gerald English, and I'm a member of Hopkins Chapel Baptist Church. And I've been able to witness to many people in the last several years, and I just pray for more opportunities to do that. But at the same time, I always need more boldness. I think we all do. And I want to uh, really hone in on how to go from a, a uh, secret conversation into a spiritual conversation. That That's something I think we all need, and I hope to uh, gain uh, some knowledge there. Fantastic, Gerald. That's uh, something a lot of us uh, need more practice at is 
how to transition in our conversations. And we'll get to that in one of the later sessions. But uh, one of the things I, I appreciate about Gerald is whenever we get together for breakfast or whatever, I always hear how he's had an opportunity to go door to door and share the gospel with some neighbors uh, or someone else that he's had an opportunity to witness to. So I really appreciate that. And then I'm going to save Mallory here for uh, in just a few minutes when Bob comes on. But uh, John, uh, introduce yourself to the group and share one thing you hope to gain by being a part of this. Hey, my name is John Oglesby. I uh, attend Central Baptist Church. I've been there since about 2011. Um, one thing I want to gain by this is, as Gerald spoke, is I need a little more boldness. I'm not shy, I don't think. Uh, but at the same time, maybe do not take advantage of the opportunities that God has given me to share the gospel. Uh, but I think most importantly, I, I like to learn a little bit more how my witness appears and how I may be damaging that witness. All right, John, I appreciate that. that and, last uh, sentence John, again. John. Could you say that last sentence one more time? I want to improve my witness and know how maybe some things in my life are damaging my witness. Thanks. So John and I have been uh, meeting together some. Uh, we've actually been looking at the book that we're going to be going through in this cohort, The One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven. But John is a member of my Sunday school class, and uh, uh, we've kind of developed a relationship with each other where we're meeting together for uh, for mentoring and for iron to sharpen iron. So um, it's uh, good to have John as a part of this too. Um, just um, again, my name is Daryl Davis. Uh, I'm pretty sure you all, y'all know me, but just so you know, I've been involved in vocational evangelism now for 20 years and I've uh, been in time, a time of transition for uh, almost a year now, but I really believe God has lead me back into vocational evangelism full time. And so uh one of the things that I hope to gain by this is I hope to learn from you guys. I know that might sound like a weird thing to say, but I've learned as, uh, as I've come along in my walk with Christ that I can learn something from everybody because every one of us have a different approach to sharing the gospel. And uh, whenever I'm around like-minded people, I've always discovered that, uh, <clears throat> you know, I learned some things uh, from folks that I'm around. So I'm excited to be able to do that and be a part of this. So uh, I want to now introduce to you Bob Boyd. Uh, Bob and I go back, way back, all the way to I first met Bob uh, at Amsterdam 2000. And that's a conference for evangelists. And from there, we kind of developed a relationship. And Bob has been one of my mentors. I, I really appreciate his wisdom in a lot of different areas. Uh, he uh, has founded New Fire for Christ Ministries, and God has used him in tremendous ways. Him and Mallory both, they both are a part of the ministry, uh, particularly in Africa, where they were able, by God's grace, to start a school of discipleship that was reaching somewhere around 100,000 students per week uh, through the different uh, people that they have trained and equipped. And Mallory, she uh, trains and equips folks as well. So she's on board with us here this morning. She's kind of uh, running the technical stuff back there for Bob. But uh, Bob, I'm glad you're with us today. I appreciate you taking the time to be able to share with our group uh, how you make gospel conversations a part of your everyday life. And so, Bob, I'm going to just uh, let you share just a brief bit about your ministry and background, and then we'll get into that. for. Uh, part of the session well so just a little bit about our ministry first yes sir yeah we have we uh i was a pastor uh years ago of a growing church on the original walden's mountain of tv fame and um, you can imagine what that was like out in the country but it was a good introduction to pastoring and then uh we prayed that God would open a door to be an evangelist. We felt we could reach more people that way, although we saw many people on Walls Mountain come to Christ. Uh, but Campus Crusade, also known as Crew now, invited us to come on staff as a national speaker. That was a miracle all by itself. 
um, only the second person ever is ever in the history of that organization been invited to do that. But we um, we spent about 12 years with crew speaking on university campuses. It's been said we've spoken to more university students than anyone else in America. Uh, so we've been very blessed. About 200 campuses we've been on, and that's been wonderful. But then God led us to start New Fire for Christ because we began going overseas a great deal more. And uh, we have ministries in nine countries now. Kenya is our largest. We've got 115,000 people we're discipling in Kenya through our team there. So God has been wonderful and opened so many doors. You know, I remember, I remember when I first came to Christ and I said, Lord, use me. And I witnessed over 100 people and not a single one came to Christ. And, uh, and I said, you know, Lord, I'm the, you call me to do this. I'm the biggest failure in the history of evangelists. You know? <laughs> and, and he said, well, have you learned a lesson? And uh, I said, I can't do it. He said, that's it. That's lesson number one. You can't. He said, but now lesson number two, I can. He said, I'm going to use you. And he began to use us. And we saw a Muslim. The first guy was a Muslim to come to Christ. You know, the hardest to reach people in the world. And um, then, it, like a snowball, we saw tens and hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of people come to Christ. And uh, so now we've been blessed to, to have a ministry around the world that's reaching uh, hundreds of thousands of people with the gospel and millions on TV. So we're, we're, we're grateful for that background. It's, God gets all the credit, and it's great to talk about this subject. Boy, feel the power. That's the way I, I title this message about, um, about evangelism. Because when we, when we get between the love of God and the hurt of the world, and he, his love flows through us to a hurting world, that's when we feel his power and like nothing else really. And so that's what I guess we're going to talk about today. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate that. A um, couple of things that I've asked Bob to talk about. First of all, Bob, why do you feel like it's important for believers to individually share their faith with others? Why it's important. I'm sorry to say it. It's a little why not it's that loud. Okay. Why it's important for believers to share their faith with other people. With other non with non believers. Well, boy. Well, first of all, Jesus commanded us to do it. You know, I mean, the the theme verse of the Book of Acts, which of course is the the church at its most explosive growth in history at the beginning. Uh, the theme verse is Acts one eight, when Jesus said, "But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth." And, of course, Jesus was saying, I'm going to give you the power of the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ. But that power is for a reason. That power isn't just so you can enjoy Christ. That power is so that you can be my witnesses to the world. And some people say, well, you know, I'm a witness by the way I live. And I'm sorry. The original Greek word there and that's translated witness is martyria, from which we get the word martyr. In other words, you've got to be willing to give your life to be a witness. And not only that, it's used of people who speak about their uh, belief, not just people who live a life. So what, there's really no choice about it if you look at the Greek, it reinforces it. A witness is someone who testifies what he has seen and heard. So whether it be Greek or English, it's very obvious that if you read uh, Wax 1A, the theme verse of the entire book, um, that he's saying, this is my purpose for you, besides knowing me, is that you would make me known, right. that you would be my witness to the world. Mm -hmm. And so I like to share this with people because, you know, the evangelical church in America is flatlined. We're not growing. And this is a tragedy because, praise God, there are a lot of evangelicals, but, you know, people are going to hell by the tens of millions. and we are not reaching them for Christ. And so I think it's vital that we ourselves become evangelistic or be evangelistic and teach our flock, our, sh our sheep, um, how they too can be witnesses for Christ. So um, anyway, I just want to share with you some about how you, can, how you can feel the power, how you can get between the love of God and the hurt of the world and allow God's love to flow through you to a hurting world in a powerful way. So... Tell me when I won't make you going. 
No, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, how would you, just uh, curious, how would you prepare your own heart to have a personal encounter with someone who needed Christ? Well, I think two things. I think if I came within an inch of hell when I came to Christ, so that gives me an advantage. <laughs> Um, I was, I literally was walking out into the Lafayette river to commit suicide when I felt a hand on my shoulder and a voice that said, that's far enough. You belong to me. And mm -hmm. I went back up and listened to God. This is Christmas night of 1975. And, um, and, and I said, Lord, if, if you're there, you know, this is it. I, I need to know. And, uh, Jesus Christ stepped into that room in such a powerful way that I've never doubted since for a moment that he's real. And uh, he, he, he made me a new human being. And so as I began to ponder, I had a great background. I was going to William and Mary. I had good grades. I could have been a doctor. I could have been a lawyer. I don't think there's any question about it. Could have been a politician, I suppose. But the, the Lord just said, nope, I got something better. I want you to tell people about me. And I thought, you know, it is better. It's the greatest work in the world. And so if God has called you to preach the gospel, it's been said, don't stoop to be a king. You know, that's the truth. This is the greatest thing of all. And so what a joy to be able to, to let God's power flow through us and his message to, to reach people for Christ. So anyway, um, I have some other things I can share with you. Shall I keep going or or do you want to answer? No, go ahead, man. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you loose because you know what you've prepared. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I want to hear. If you have some questions, you can feel free to interrupt. But um, yeah, some years ago, I attended a large Jewish wedding, and they got to the. Have you ever been to a Jewish wedding? They 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 have a ceremony that, at least in this Jewish wedding, where they wrap a glass in a towel or in a cloth. And the bridegroom, you may have seen him in the movies, actually. The bridegroom, he stamps on the glass <laughs> and breaks it into lots of pieces. And, uh, you know, that says something about their marriage, I guess. But whatever. Anyway, he's, he's getting ready to step on the glass. And uh, the rabbi explained the meaning of this. I thought it was fascinating. He said, you see, the glass represents happiness or fulfillment, the rabbi said. In a minute, the bridegroom's going to stamp on the glass, break it into thousands of pieces, and, uh, and basically that's like life. And I thought, what? He said, you see, we go through life and we have a success here or an achievement there. And it's like picking up pieces of the broken glass and trying to reassemble the glass of happiness. And basically he said, we go through our whole life trying to reassemble the glass of happiness and nobody ever gets the whole glass, but we spend our life picking up the pieces. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that's not right. <laughs> you know, when Jesus Christ came into my life, you know, he didn't give me a little here and a little there. He gave me total fulfillment in him. And I mean, I just, I can hardly keep from leaping to my feet and shouting, I've got the whole glass. But they were dressed to kill and they would have killed me maybe instead. <laughs> it just, it wasn't the right thing to do at the time, I guess. But you know what? You and I, we have received the whole glass. Right. We have complete fulfillment. We have the secret the world is looking for. Sometimes I don't even know. I'm an evangelist. I talk about it, but even think, how come I don't shout it from the housetops more? I mean, it's kind of like, what can hold you back? I mean, we got the best thing in the world. So what do we do about it? And I think what we do about it is just to say, okay, when I get between the love of God and the hurt of the world and allow God's love to flow through me to a hurting world, that's when I feel his power. And that's what we need to train our people to do as well. And uh, fortunately, we've trained thousands, tens of thousands of people how to share their faith. And, and many have, many thousands of them have picked it up and they've gone and done it. And they've led lots of people to Christ. And, you know, it's, it's multiplication the way it was meant to be. So I guess I like to ask our audiences, are you experiencing the power of, your, of God in your life? Are you experiencing supernatural power? Because if you want to, Here's how. First of all, let Jesus be Lord. And then if he's Lord, he says, you shall be my witnesses. And that mm -hmm. word marturia, from which we get the word martyr, <laughs> means to be an out-and-out -out vocal witness for Christ, like a witness in a courtroom. And there is nothing less 
I mean, anybody who doesn't talk to people about Christ is disobedient to God. So guess what? You, you may not need, need to be an evangelist. You may not have a special gift, but you need to tell people about Christ. It's common sense. It's like if your family was dying of your cancer and your friends and you had the cure for cancer, what kind of person would you be if you kept them from the cure? If you didn't say anything about it? And yet we have the cure for something that is far worse than cancer. We have the cure for sin and death forever. And so, you know, sometimes we have to get ourselves motivated and say, Lord, you know, let me speak. We have a, we have a little tradition. Now, the Bible doesn't say that you must do it this way. But when we're with someone for more than five minutes who we don't know, like a waiter in a restaurant, you know, or something, we're going to share Christ with that person. because. You know, this may be the only chance they get to hear it. And so while everybody doesn't have to do it that way, the Bible doesn't say five minutes, you know. <laughs> but the point is, it does say we're to tell other people about Christ. And um, I believe that's the reason we don't experience the power of God like we could. The NFL, for the guys, especially the National Football League, had the slogan, feel the power, for years. Maybe they still have it, I don't know. But... Anyway, do you feel the power? That's what I like to ask our people. Do you feel the supernatural power of God in your life? Well, you can, but you have to step out in faith and be a witness for Jesus Christ. You need to tell other people about him. Um, you know, I, I guess Acts 1.8, you shall be my witnesses, that's his command. But then I also want to say, that uh, that he told us to start where we are. Notice he says, you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem. Well, guess where they were when they were talking about that? Jerusalem. Okay, so we're supposed to start where we are, like it's saying Norfolk, Virginia, or Richmond, or wherever. And start where you are, and then go to the next place, the state of Virginia, in our case, and then go to America, and then go to the world. Now, not one person can go everywhere, but basically that's his, that is his will for the body of Christ to reach the whole world with the gospel. So now God promised us his power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I love that word power. Um, and it's the word uh, dunamis from which we get the English word dynamite. And we're not talking about a little power. We're talking about dynamite power. And you know, basically, when he used the word, there was no invented dynamite yet. But when they invented dynamite, they said, let's look for the Greek word that, ex that really ex exhibits power. And they use the same word that's used in Acts 1, verse 8. You should receive dynamite power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And that power is for a purpose, and that is that you be my witnesses. So we experience God's power when we're his witnesses. I mean, we have seen people come back from comas. They were supposed to be dead forever. You know, they were just minutes away from, or hours rather, away from death. We see people come out of comas to give their life to Christ. I mean, it's supernatural. And God does and can raise people from the dead still, just like he did back in Jesus' day. Now, he didn't always do that, obviously, or maybe a lie. But he, when he wants to get someone's attention, he will do whatever it takes to get their attention. If we could be used as a vessel by him, filled with the Holy Spirit, ready for him to, to use us. So anyway, that's, I want to share that with you. And then um, let me get to my next page here. Um, so what does it mean to be a witness? Well, and let me reiterate this. Many people say I'm a witness by my life, you know. But remember, the word witness is the same word as a witness in a courtroom. So he's got to say what he saw or else he's not a real witness. Now, I remember when I found this out when I was about how God's love flows through you when I was at William and Mary. That's where I went to undergraduate school. And I wasn't a, I wasn't a believer until my last year, my senior year. Well, when I went back to William and Mary to finish with one semester left, um, I said, Lord, I wasted the three and a half years I was here before. Could you somehow use me? So <laughs> it 
God, God has this way of doing things. So I began to, to witness the different people and nobody seemed to want to hear what I had to say. And, uh, I did have a swimming class, you know, William and Mary, it's an interesting thing. They re require you, or at least they did to take a swim test and you got to be able to swim up and down the pool a few times or else you don't graduate. Well, I think that's pretty interesting. But I was, a, I was a lifeguard for Pete's sake, you know? Come on, just let me swim a few laps and no class. They said, nope, you got to take the class. So I thought, well, maybe God has some reason for this. So I, I enrolled in the class. Well, there was this, this, this girl. This is before I met Maori. There was this girl in the class who was really fast. You know, we would do relay races at the end of the day. And um, it was not good for my male ego, but we would usually anchor the team for the race. And it'd be real close. They would touch. and I would jump into the water and um, Maureen would jump into the water and I'd swim as fast as I could. And when I got to finally, I touched the end, you know, I'm supposed to be ahead cause I'm the guy. I look up and Maureen was just sitting there, you know, she blew me out of the water. She was so fast. <laughs> it was very embarrassing, but it was pretty cool because Maureen was, this was way before I met my wonderful wife, Mallory. Maureen was, you know, cute and, athletic and smart and all these good things. I thought, man, I'd like to get to go to know this girl better. I'm sure my motivation was totally pure. And um, anyway, I said, uh, I, I would walk back with her to the dorms and finally the last day of school came and I thought, I still haven't been a witness to her. Man, Lord, what have I done? So the last day of school that I ever spent at William Mary, I'm walking back with her and uh, saying goodbye for the last time I'm sure I'd ever see her. And she said, Bob, there's something different about you. I'd like to know what it is. Well, in evangelism, we shouldn't wait for that kind of question normally. But I said, if Maureen, if there's anything different about me, it's the fact that, that God is the king of my life, Jesus Christ. And would you like to know more about him? She said, yes, I would. And I explained to her how Christ had died for her sins and risen from the dead and, and how he could come into her life. And and fill her with love and joy and peace. And I said, would you like to invite Christ in your life? And she said, yes, I would. I said, would you like to do that right now? She said, yes, I would. And we knelt down there in our dorm room and she was transformed. She invited Christ into her life. It was magnificent. And you know, God wants to use us to give people eternal life. If that's the only thing that happened in my life, it would be a great life but we've had the chance to see tens of thousands of people come to Christ around the world since then. What a joyous men. But you know, it's something only God can do. And I, I just always remember that, that we can't do it, but Lord, you can. So, you know, you and I are surrounded by people on the outside. They're gifted. They're successful. They drive BMWs or Mercedes or whatever, but they're lonely for the love that will never let them go. And you and I have the secret that the world of life, that the, that the uh, world is looking for. So after finishing uh, college I, and internship, I um, you know, did seminary and all that kind of thing. And for seven years of seminary, I got educated beyond my intelligence, you know, and it was, it was a good, great education. But then, um, then I became in the midst of all that, I became a pastor. Uh, some of you remember the old TV show, uh, The Waltons. And Mallory, could you get me a, can you get me a tissue or something? Right. That'd be great. Um, anyway, the, you mean, remember The Waltons? Anybody remember that TV show? Yeah. It was the number one show on TV for years. Anyway, we, my first church was a church on the original Waltons Mountain after seminary. <laughs> Of TV fame. And I don't mean a place like that. I mean the real place, you know, <laughs> it's called Skyler. It's outside of Charlottesville. And anyway, we went there and um, we began to, we began to preach the gospel, which they had never really heard in that Methodist church, I'm afraid for a long time. And people began to come to Christ. And for the first time in decades, the church began to grow. And, uh, and then, uh, and then we, we thought, boy, this is, we should go to a bigger church. And so we got invited to be pastor of a larger church. And, and yet, and then we thought, you know, I could reach more people by being an evangelist. 
than I could by being a pastor. So I kind of thought if I'm a pastor of a church of 10,000 people, which I thought we could do, and I believe we could, the Lord said, that's just 10,000 people. You know, there's millions of people who are going to hell. What can you do about it? And I thought, well, now being a pastor is a way harder than most people think. Those of you who are pastors, you know, uh, boy, you get to solve everybody's problems. And I mean, in a way, it was easier to be an evangelist, but I thought I want to be an evangelist. And so God opened the door to do that. I'm saying all this to you because these things can apply to where you are, I believe, in terms of reaching people to Christ. So I became, I was invited to become a national speaker with Campus Crusade, which we call Crew. And I spoke on over 200 university campuses over about 15 years. I've been told that's more than any other person in America. I've spoken to more students than anyone else in America in the last 20 some years. So what a privilege that has been. But then we found a new ministry because we began to think overseas and we started New Fire for Christ. If you want to know more about our ministry sometime, look up New Fire for Christ on the internet. But we found that everywhere we go, people are hungry to hear how God loves them. And, um, and here in America, uh, we've been to 150 major campuses and um, often we have people come together and th you know hundreds of students in auditoriums then we speak in fraternities and sororities you have to ask yourself if i'm going to reach people for christ how do i get outside the local church because that's not where they are how do i get into the community how do i go door to door or how do i speak to the rotary club or how do i speak in in different venues you have to think outside the church because the bible says go it doesn't say invite. Our main strategy in the American church is invite people to come. It doesn't work very well. I mean, some churches, yes, they grow quite a bit, but mainly the way we get people to come to Christ is to go to them. And over the, lot, over the years, we've just seen thousands of students, particularly because we focus on students to come to Christ. Because many people in the world won't listen to a pastor or an evangelist like me. They think he lives in an ivory power, ivory tower, or, or what am I trying to say? Uh, um, an ivy tower. He doesn't know what to struggle with. At least that's what many think people think. But the question is, who will they listen to? Well, they'll listen to our people. If we train our people how to share their faith, you know, they will respond just like we saw happen on Walton's Mountain and as we've seen happen in many churches around the world. Overseas, we've started 45 churches and they have grown to have tens of thousands of people attending. You know, what a, what a privilege it is to start all these churches. And we train our churches, hey, you wanna grow? Well, you're under our authority anyway, so yes, you better wanna grow, you know? <laughs> and they say, how? I say, well, you go out to the schools, you speak in the schools where you can, where you speak in any place you can reach non-Christians and you go door to door, you just think, God, give me a way to go outside the church to reach the people who wouldn't darken the door of a church if I didn't take a step to reach them. For instance, for a pastor in America, very simple, door to door. You know, visiting, first of all, the people who visited your church who might not be believers, and you don't know whether they're believers, but they visit your church. Do you go visit them? I hope you do, because, you know, who could be more receptive than that person who actually came and listened to you? And then you get to go and get to know them better, get to find out where they are spiritually, get to lead them to Christ. That worked for us when I was a pastor, and I find it works for other pastors, too. And then door to door in the community. Um, we we saw, I, I sat in a church where we attended a few years ago, Tabernacle Church of Norfolk, one of the largest churches in Norfolk. I counted 90 people who were there because we had gone door to door. Now, that wasn't even our full-time job. That was just half a day a week. We went to visit people because we went outside to the non-Christians. They came to Christ and many of them, not all, but many of them came to the church and became part of it. So. The, the, it all boils down to one two-letter word, G-O, the first word of the Great Commission. Are we going or are we inviting? 
because to invite is not the same as going to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. in their homes, at their workplace, if need be, wherever, mainly in their homes, to talk with them about the Lord Jesus Christ so that they will have a chance to come to him. Well, I think God wants us to be um, a witness. And he says in Ephesians chapter four, you know, there are four great offices God has given the church and he calls some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Well, you could call that one or two offices, let's, you know, four or five offices, apostles, prophets. Most of us think that that's mainly in the past, but then evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Okay. What is our job? Is it our job to do the ministry? No. They exist to quote Ephesians 4, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, our job is not to do the ministry directly, primarily. Our job is for our people to do the ministry. And that's what made the early church so powerful. They used to say, loosely quoting it, those Christians won't shut up. They just keep all these people, they're fanatics about Christ. They're always telling us about how we can have a new life in Christ. Well, that wasn't the pastors. That was the parishioners. That was the, the members of the church. Because the whole church told others about Christ and grew rapidly as a result. Well, um, we discovered this at... Uh, we discovered this at Tabernacle Church of Norfolk. We, we, we were attending, and as I say, we went door to door. I'm going to skip over a lot of this, but basically, uh, we saw the church grow by 60 and then 90 people because we went door to door to share Christ with people. Now, wouldn't that be cool to add 60 or 90 people to your church, or if you have a church of 1,000 people, to add 200 people, 300 people? That would be pretty cool, and we can do it. What we got to do is go after them. It takes time, it takes work, and yet it's fruitful. Um, one of my friends when I was young was a guy named Frank Pace. Now, Frank was an outstanding athlete. He was a tennis player at Maury High School. Everybody loved him. But one day he was canoeing on the river near our house. They call it the Lafayette River. And um, he capsized. Well, you know, they tell you that when you capsize in a boat, because canoe is a pretty small boat, but that you're supposed to stick with the boat till someone rescues you. That's kind of protocol, right? Well, okay, so he stuck with the canoe with his brother, um, Clay. Well, the problem was it was kind of late in the day and it was that time of the year, like right now, April or so, when the air is warm, but the water is still cold. So they stayed there hanging on to this thing and dark darkness came and night fell. And here they were, they knew they weren't gonna make it through the night. They were starting to shake all over. So anyway, Frank said, let's, let's, let's go, let's strike out for sure. So they did. And um, Clay was starting to go under and Frank said, hold on to me. So he, grabbed him and he kept swimming and, Clay, and Frank kept swimming and finally Clay got up and Clay started up on the shore. But my friend Frank disappeared beneath the surface about 20 feet from shore. They found his body a week later when they dredged the Lafayette River. Now, my friend Frank loved his brother enough he was willing to give up his life so he could live. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and me. And if he did that for me, and I really get it, is there anything I wouldn't do for him? If he told me to crawl on my hands and knees on burning coals across the United States, I would do it. I might die trying, but I would do it. It always gets me when people say, I don't know if I can go on the missions field. I think, do you even get what Christ did for you? That's nothing. Nothing. If they stone you to death, that's nothing. And he said, go. He commanded us to go. He didn't make it a divine suggestion. And so it's our job to go. 
I remember when I began to go um, as a new Christian, and we started a nursing home ministry because we realized, you know, people in nursing homes are really lonely. They don't have people to, you know, they don't have people to, to, a lot of times their family doesn't even come and visit them. So God gave us a special burden for those who are critically ill and about to die and know about it. So I got to know the social worker at one of, at one of these nursing homes. And, and I said, look, if you have somebody who's about to die and they don't know Christ, because this gal was a, a believer. I said, if, if they're about to die, then would you please call me? Let me know. No. So one day the phone rang and, and, um, uh, my friend said, well, I didn't even know if I should call you, but there's, there's a guy here named Vince von Stein and he does not know Christ. And he is a hair away from, he's that, you know, far from death. And she, she said, in fact, he's not even awake. He's in a coma and he's been in a coma for the last, I don't know if it was a day or two, whatever. And he's going to die any minute and, or any hour. We don't know. So she said, I just thought you'd like to know. So we hang up the phone. I thought, what can I do? This guy's in a coma. He doesn't even talk to you, you know? I mean, but I thought, well, at least I can try, you know? So I went down to the nursing home and walked into this room with Mr. Von Stein. And there he, there he was, completely unconscious, you know? And I said, Mr. Von Stein, you know, I tried to introduce myself. And it's like talking to the wall, you know? He's, he's asleep. And so I said, well... I got on my knees. I was desperate. I said, God, you know, I need you to show up and please help me. And so I leaned over. I, I, I shouted into Mr. Von Stein's ear. I said, Mr. Von Stein, if you believe the gospel that I just shared with you, then I want you to indicate that you believe by, he was lying on his back. I said, by lifting a hand and putting it on your chest, since you can't talk. Maybe you can move your arms because he had been moving his arms a little bit. So he was like, yes. He goes, his hand came up. I couldn't believe it. I thought, this is great. This is wonderful. This is, well, you never know. He's been twitching around a little bit, you know, and, and I don't know. It's like he, he's still like a stone, but his arm moved. I don't know if that was real. So I got on my knees again. I said, Lord, you know, please give me a sign. <laughs> Help me to believe. And so I said, Mr. Monson, I'm going to ask you another time. If you really want to invite Christ in your life, I'd like you to raise your other hand and put it on your chest. So he was lying with his hands at his side again. He goes, his hand came up. I thought, this is great. This is wonderful. This is, well, you never know. <laughs> oh, you have little faith, right? So I said his movements hadn't been real coordinated. I mean, he had been kind of twitching, like I said. And so finally I got on my knees. I said, God, give me a sign. Well, you know, God's not in the habit of just giving us a sign whenever we want from one. But in this case, he said, my boy's desperate. Okay. Tell him to make a coordinated movement. So I, I said, Mr. Von Stein, I'm going to ask you one last time. If you would put both, if you really want to have Christ in your life, as, 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 I said, I want you to put them raise your hands together and put them over your heart and hold them there. And there was nothing, nothing. And then I prayed with Mr. Von Stein with his hands on his heart. And I went home rejoicing. I knew he had eternal life. <laughs> and I called the next day. I said, how's Mr. Von Stein? They said, he's gone. I thought he's in heaven for eternity because God can use someone as weak and as sinful as me to share the gospel. And my friends, when we teach our people, we have the secret of life. It's our great privilege to share with our people how they can share the secret of life with a world that's going to hell and to give them eternal life. You know, it's been said, if God has called you to preach the gospel, don't stoop to be a king. I appreciate President Trump. 
but I have a more important job than President Trump. So do you, if you give people eternal life. Well, I guess I just, there's, you know, you could always say more, but I, I just want you to know that when we get between the love of God and the hurt of the world, that's when we see God's power. And I like to say to our folks, let's have a definite to do from this. Are you willing today to make the commitment to say, I'm going to share Christ with someone this week, someone in my family, some friend, someone I know is lost, and I'm going to share Christ with them. You say, well, I'm scared they might say no or they might take offense. Big deal. The disciples were willing to be murdered for their witness, and they were. You realize that of the 12, only one survived. 11 of them died violently because they were willing to die for Christ. Are we? It's our job to share Christ with others no matter what it costs. It's the greatest thing we can do. Well, we, we will be glad in heaven when we did it. So I like to say, you know, will you make a specific commitment to share Christ with someone this week? And I'm going to ask us to bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand if you're willing to make that commitment to share Christ with someone this week. Okay. So let's, I guess I'm going to open my eyes because I don't look at everybody. But <laughs> besides that, everybody else. Does. Okay. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. And except for me. And, uh, Lord, these friends, thank you for these new friends, and thank you for Daryl and his heart for you. It's wonderful. And Lord, we ask that you would call us to be witnesses, that you would not, you already called us, but that we would respond to your call, and that we would share Christ with someone this week. And so if you're willing to say, yes, I will share Christ with someone this week, this eyes closed, heads bowed, except for mine, but just raise your hand. If you say, I'm going to do that this week. God bless you. God bless you. God bless just about all of you. So put your hand down, please. And then just pray with me. I'll, I'll pray and pray for you. And then you can be praying your own, on your own along with this. Okay. It's pretty simple. Lord Jesus, thank you for your command. You shall be my witnesses. Lord, if we're going to be obedient to you, we must be. We must tell others about you. Lord, I ask for these wonderful people, new friends, that you would anoint them with your Holy Spirit, fill them with your Spirit, and grant them open doors with family or friends or to write a letter, however they're led to do it, to share Christ with someone this week. Lord, maybe even more than one, like we try to do one a day. But Lord, to start off with, just... Give them at least one person this week to share Christ with. And Lord, whatever the response is, that's up to you. Lord, only you can bring people to yourself. But Lord, we ask that you would use their witness to change others' lives for eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I appreciate that, Bob. I, I really do. Uh, Thank you for sharing those stories. I think, you know, that's one of the things that we can do as a group is encourage one another with the stories that God gives us, the opportunities we have to share Christ. I, like Bob, I've been in situations before where people were literally on their deathbed. Um, my mom's cousin up in Indiana was one example of that. His name was Bob. And uh, Bob <coughs> had been an atheist pretty much all his life. Uh, he had lost a brother in Vietnam in the war and uh, was very skeptical, very hurt, and uh, my mom had witnessed to him for many, many times. Well, Bob had developed cancer, and uh, he had gone through treatment, had gone in remission, but then it came back again, and uh, it was pretty much a situation where he was not going to recover, and so uh, he had gone, started going through chemotherapy, and uh, in long story short, the Lord led me to go up to Indiana to drive up there mm -hmm. and uh, to spend a few days uh, with Bob and, and uh, 
another cousin and <clears throat> I was looking for opportunities to share with him. And uh, I, I finally found the opportunity one day and I, I sat down at the table and we started talking. Uh, you know, he said, yeah, your mom's been talking to me about all this stuff. Well, uh, in the middle of the conversation, his son walks in. And I interrupt things. I'm thinking, well, great. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and I try to continue the conversation as best as I could. I try to continue as best as I could, but it was clear that that was not the right moment. And so long story short, I was getting ready to leave the next day to go to Indianapolis uh, because uh, some friends of mine, we were doing an outreach at the Indianapolis 500. <laughs> and so uh, Bob had been feeling really bad the past couple of days. So I went into his bedroom and by his bedside, uh, I start sharing the gospel with him again. And I said, Bob, I said, would you like to invite Christ into your life? He acknowledged that he would. And so led him through that prayer of salvation. And uh, I packed up my stuff and left for Indianapolis. Well, I got word that night that Bob slipped into a coma. And about three or four days later, he passed away. Um, but, you know, it was not just my witness. It was the fruit of my mother's witness mm -hmm. and other people who had witnessed to Bob. And I just got to be there for the harvest. Uh, mm -hmm. So stories like that, that I want to encourage each other with and I want us to be willing to share. So when we have future sessions, we're going to have some sharing time uh, as a part of what we're going to do. Uh, so uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, because I don't want to. Um, drag the meeting out a whole lot on the first session. I, I want to uh, make sure that uh, we're all encouraged as we leave. So what I'm going to do is I had planned on looking at some stuff, but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, wait until the next session to look at that. But I want to say thank you, Bob, for your time and willingness to come and, and talk with us and sow into our lives. And uh, I want to encourage you all too. Uh, I, ever, did everybody receive the email with the attached copy of one thing you can't do in heaven yes okay all right so it's a pdf copy you should be able to look at it easily on your computer or on an ipad i was able to look at it on an ipad uh pretty easy but i want you to start reading that book because we're going to begin discussing it in the next session and uh so and then we'll get into some of the materials that i've prepared I've uh, got a slideshow to prepare them, but I do want to Penny put up that scripture first because I think this is an important scripture. So she's going to pull that up here real quick. All right. <clears throat> so this is actually one of my favorite verses. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So as we think about that scripture, it, it, there's a couple of things that really stands out there. First of all, we've been given a new life uh, through Christ, through our faith in Jesus Christ. He's made us new. If you know Christ, if you've trusted him as your Savior, and I, I trust everybody here has, uh, then your life has been made new. And because of that, not only have you been given a new life, but you've also been given a new mission. Look what it says. It says, we are ambassadors for Christ. So God has redeemed you and made you a new person. And then he has also given you a new job. And that's to be an ambassador for Christ. And that ambassador is to take that message of reconciliation to a lost and dying world. Um, and so it, it's important for us to get a hold of the fact that we have the new mission and we have a new, we new, have new life and we have a new mission. Uh, so, um, I want you to think about that scripture and pray on that scripture. Um, let me also do this. I don't want to jump ahead, but did anybody have a question for Bob uh, that before we uh, log off on the meeting here? Anybody want to ask anything? Daryl, I want to comment on the, uh, the verse there, and I was just reading about this uh, this afternoon said the old has died and we're new creatures. We have to remember, we're new, we're different. We're not the new and improved me, we're the different me. We're 
now Jesus, his servant. So that's, that, that, I've never really heard it that way before, but that convicted me. And, you know, you can't be happy with being the new improved me. We have to be the new creation, one under Jesus Christ. That's great. That really is, John. And, you know, I heard someone say this one time. Uh, they said that God didn't come, or Jesus didn't come to make good men better. He came to make dead men live. And I think that goes right along with that verse because we know from Scripture we are all dead in our trespasses and sin um, before coming to Christ. And Christ has made us alive through faith in him. And uh, so you're absolutely right. We're not new and improved. We're new brand new <laughs> you know any of you ever bought a brand new car and uh got in the car and it had that new car smell how wonderful that was you know had you know maybe one or two miles at the most on it i mean you know that's that's us we're we're brand new uh when we come to faith in christ and so that's a great observation anybody else want to comment or observe or uh, uh, observation or anything Y'all are a quiet group. <laughs> it's okay, good listeners. Yeah, that was true. I remember one night being up in uh, close to Washington, D.C. with Bob and his team. I think it was George Mason University. And you had just finished uh, speaking to some students. And I was there kind of an observer. And we're sitting in a restaurant at 1 o'clock in the morning talking about what needed to take place the next day. I don't know if you remember that or not, Bob. I didn't. No. Uh, I remember that. I remember that. Uh, but that. anyway. That was, that was great. College talking to students is a lot of fun, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Penny, for running everything and getting it all set up. And uh, remember, we're going to be back next week, same time, 5 o'clock. We will not meet on Mother's Day or Father's Day. Okay, so we're going to take breaks on those two days. Uh, the Sunday after Mother's Day, I'll have another guest on, and that'll be Dr. Matt Queen. Matt is uh, the Associate Dean of the School of Evangelism at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's a North Carolina native, but Matt has written a book called Everyday Evangelism, along with some other publications, but Matt is a good friend. And uh, he's going to be here encouraging you as well. Uh, he takes students out every week uh, to witness around uh, the campus there at Southwestern Seminary. They've made a commitment at Southwestern to uh, evangelize every uh, home within two miles of the seminary there in Fort Worth. And uh, so they are constantly working toward that. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, so Matt will be a guest with us. And I'm trying to work on one more guest uh, toward the end of the session. I uh, don't know who that's going to be yet. Oh, I have someone in mind, but I'm not going to share that with you. But uh, we'll try to get that in place. Let me, right. mention one, let me mention one thing, because you mentioned that. And that is, um, if you want to know more about our ministry and maybe pray for us, New Fire for Christ on the Internet uh, is tells you about what we're doing around the world, 10 nations. I won't talk much about it right now. But if you want to look at that, we would love to, to hear from you or at least have you um uh, yeah there there it is i guess and yeah penny brought it up for you bob <laughs> okay excellent okay so that gives you much fire for christ on yeah details. so you can actually see a great picture here of some of the ministry they're doing to the students here in africa um so bob's also had an opportunity to speak several times on 700 club and a lot of other ministry but you can explore his website and see some of the pictures and uh some of the things that they've done uh, in their ministry and it's got my name on here, but my wife, Mallory, is every bit as important. She really started our biggest ministry in Kenya. And anyway, she's uh, much better looking than me. I don't know why she's not on here, but <laughs> anyway, she, she's uh, she, it's us plus staff. We've got lots of staff around the world. So, Yeah, and, and actually, too, when you guys uh, got that ministry started there in Africa, I believe you had some of your boys with you, too. Is that right, Bob? Yes, yeah. Some of our because boys they were doing like school. soccer clinics and stuff. Yeah, they even went to school over in Africa so we could be there for years. Um, yeah. You know, you can't build you can't build a discipleship for 115,000 people by a little visit. It's been years and years we spent in Kenya. 
Yeah. So, in fact, so. Bob was supposed to be going back over that uh, way uh, about this time. And because of all the coronavirus stuff, they've had to postpone that. So be in prayer for that, too. That's right. Yeah, I appreciate your prayers for that. I, I do think, though, the Lord is smart. You know, the Lord is hot, duh, smart. He's, I've been, I don't know, if you think of praying for us, pray that I'd write. Is uh, I've got publishers who want me to write a first book or two, and, and that's nice. But uh, I've been putting it off for some I'd rather, and it's like the Lord's painting me into a corner. I can't go overseas. <laughs> and I'm, there are not too many, you know, right now I'm not focusing on the U.S. And it's like, okay, right, right, right. So, Anyway, you might shoot a prayer for me about that. <laughs> yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, uh, Bob would definitely appreciate it. So we'll, we'll have to talk about the writing thing, Bob, uh, as I've actually had an opportunity to do some writing for some people. So uh, anyway, all right. Well, thanks for being here. I'm going to ask Gerald English if he'll unmute his mic there and close us out in prayer today. Gerald, you still here? Gerald, uh, you still here? If you would close us in prayer. Okay, Gerald. You got me? Yeah, you're done. You're on the meeting. Gracious Heavenly Father, this day I appreciate and everything you do. I thank you for the service today. I thank you for this time on the internet with uh, you Christian friends. And I just pray, dear Lord, that we do make that commitment in our hearts to share Christ to a lost and dying world. May we be on the front lines because we love you and that we love you because you first loved us. Bring us back next week, and I pray more and more people will come online. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Amen. All right, y'all, feel free to invite some other folks to join us for the next session. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, and uh, you can respond to the email that I sent you with that. So thanks again, and I hope y'all have a great rest of your day. Take care. God bless you. God bless you.